Welcome everyone to TAM Lab number 54. Uh, today we're excited to have Dale McKay joining us. Uh, he's going to be going through a VCF lab constructor implementation that he did in his home lab. Uh, the, the lab constructor is essentially a way to deploy a nested VMware Cloud Foundation environment. So uh, should be a pretty exciting session. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll hand it over to Dale and you can take it away, Dale. Thank you very much, Steve. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Whatever the case may be, depending upon when you're watching this. My name is Dale McKay. I'm a senior technical account manager. I primarily work on the NSTAM team, but have uh, spent a lot of time inside a couple of major accounts. Anyway, uh, that's enough about me. The focus of today is going to be, like Steve mentioned, on what's known as VLC or the VCF Lab Constructor. Just a little bit of background. Um, I, I first saw VLC about a year ago, and I kept kind of playing around with it in my mind. Of, yeah, I want to do this. I want to do this. And I have a pretty extensive home lab. I'm going to show you guys a diagram here in just a few minutes. But um, my home lab actually has a lot of stuff in it that I kind of use on a daily basis. So I was kind of reluctant because, you know, you're always afraid of what you don't know. I was kind of reluctant to just jump in feet first into the whole VLC implementation and potentially risk kind of blowing up what was a very stable home lab environment. Um, so eventually I, I wound up actually buying some hardware to accommodate standing up uh, VLC. And now that I've been through that process, I wanted to kind of make my learnings, my best practices, the things I learned from doing that available to you guys to maybe help get you over if you have that same kind of hump like I did, like, yeah, hey, I got a pretty good uh, lab environment going. I don't want to do anything to mess it up to show you how yeah, maybe those fears might be just a little bit unfounded. And I'm really almost pointing more at myself as I'm saying that than necessarily at you guys. So the way I want to work today is I want to blast through about maybe eight or ten slides that I have for you, and then I'm going to walk you through a lot of what uh, we're going to talk about in the slides. I'm going to show you the jump box. I'm going to show you some of the scripts. I'm going to show you some of the JSON files that you need to edit. I'm going to show you what the end product looks like. Um, and then once we do all that, I'd kind of like to open it up to maybe some um, crowd-guided questions. In other words, maybe there's something that you want to see that, you know, because you've never seen one of these environments, you don't know how it should look. And I'll be more than glad to just open up everything that I have for you guys to look and see so that helps you maybe go home and um, implement this in your lab. Here's why I think it's important that you do this. If you heard, I think it was either Pat or Sanjay won, uh, when we did the virtual worldwide kickoff, he mentioned, I think the number was 66% of all new NSX customers are coming to us via VCS. That's a huge number. And if they're implementing VCS and, and NSX through VCS, then I think it's important that we at least understand that process and be able to kind of talk them through that. So that's that's kind of how I'd like to do things today. I want to make this as interactive as possible after uh, we get to a certain point because I think there's some things I need to just show you and walk you through up front and then we'll get into the interactive. All right, does that work for everybody? Uh, I guess we shouldn't. I shouldn't leave an open question. Anybody? No. <laughs> that sounds good. Man. Yeah, because, yeah, all right, good. Thank you, Steve. All right. 
So, uh, like Steve mentioned, uh, VLC is an automated tool that deploys an entire nested cloud foundation environment onto a single physical host or a, a vSphere cluster. Uh, you will see, and let me just kind of, I'm going to actually skip ahead in my presentation and take you. Here is the physical platform that everything that we're going to see today has actually been deployed on. It's a R620, 256 gig of uh, RAM. It's got um, all SSDs in it. <clears throat> I probably have uh, around $850 in this server. Um, purchased off of eBay, crafted with my own hands. And just one little note, and I'm going to show you the VCF environment later. Let me just get my little annotate spotlight going here. These numbers that you see right here are numbers with the VCF environment running. So as it's running today, and I'll show it to you in a few minutes, it's consuming just a little bit over half of the RAM that's in that box, and you can see the CPU uh, utilization. Nice. Also, and while we're at it, and, and well, well, with one caveat that I'll show you when we get there. Okay. Here's a high-level diagram. Um, this is my entire home lab. We're really focused on this area over here. This is that singular R620 that I implemented uh, VLC on. It connects to a Dell 5548 one gig switch up to my Cisco ISR. And then we jump over to what I'm calling the nested environment. And here's that nested environment. You'll, you'll notice that this diagram will look amazingly familiar if you've ever looked at the VLC user guide. I probably should have put a copyright on here because Ben and uh, Heath actually provided me this diagram, but this is actually how my nested environment is configured with the actual IP addresses and everything. You'll see that these will vary uh, from what the defaults are, and I'll explain why I did that as we move through this. But in the 391 VLC implementation, we create this AVN portion over here, and uh, that requires some BGP functionality. That requires some other things that, as we walk through today, I'll, talk, I'll address. But this is just a high-level um, nested diagram, high-level kind of physical diagram, if you will, and then the physical platform that the VLC is running on. All right, let me back up here my agenda. So as you begin to do this, one of the first things I would urge you to do is to read. There are several good blogs out on how to implement uh, VLC. Um, the guys responsible for VLC actually wrote a couple of these, so that would probably be a real good place to start, like this first one. But there are other uh, blogs out there that are actually very helpful. Another thing that you want to do is you want to join the VLC support at Slack. Now, this is a separate workspace. Um, you'll need to join it outside of your VMware workspace. Uh, at least that's what worked for me. And you'll definitely want to get a hold of the VCF lab constructor install guide. And you say, okay, how do I get a hold of that lab constructor install guide? If you look up the downloads for VMware Cloud Foundation Lab Constructor, it will take you to a Google Doc where you can fill out all the required information. And eventually, you'll get to the point where you can download a zip file that has all of these particular uh, files in it. All right, now let's go from there to the next page here that I talked about the download. And again, the best thing you can do is read, read, and read, and plan some more. I thought I had done this, and I did my first deploy and figured out that the management network 
was the same as my ISP network. So that wasn't going to work. I wasn't going to have any external connectivity. So I had to go back and address, address some address changes. And like I said, I thought I had read, I thought I'd thought all this through. I was like really happy about doing it. But you will find that uh, the more mature current lab environment you have, probably the more you need to read and think through this, particularly with things like IPs, like I just mentioned, uh, MTU size, how do you want to handle BGP? How do you want to do your external connectivity? I have uh, proxies. I have a lot of things in my home lab that I ended up having to go back and touch to kind of make this work. Um, you may or may not have that uh, issue, but again, I would encourage you to just read, read, and then read some more and then do some planning. First, one of the first things you're going to want to do is configure a jump box. It needs to be a Windows 10 box with two NICs, PowerShell. All of this is in the install guide. One thing that's not in the install guide is I recommend that you download Visual Studio Code. I found it to be a really useful tool in terms of editing the JSON files. And then, of course, you're going to need to download all of the VCF uh, software. So let me just give you a picture of what my jump box looks like. We're on my jump box right now. So Windows 10 box. That uh, download for VCF will uh, create this folder right here. And you can see here are some of those files. Uh, build it for me. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. I will build it. We'll talk about that some more. Here's that install guide that I mentioned. So download that. Additionally, you'll need to download all of the software that you need to instantiate the Software Defined Data Center. You can see I've got uh, my SDDC manager, Cloud Builder, NSX manager, my um, vCenter appliance, everything that I needed. I went with the um, Dell customized um, image. And I'll show you where that kind of came back on me just a little bit. But anyway, you'll want to download all of these. You'll want to download the zip file. And like I said, it'll create this folder where if you have everything else that you need, that dual NIC, the right version of uh, PowerShell, all of those things, then you can begin to do. And let me just hop back over to my presentation for just a minute. You can begin to do some JSON um, customization. So let's take a look at one of the first things that you might want to customize and it's this JSON file called Default Management Host Hardware. And in it, this is where you declare the values for CPU, memory, and disk that you want the initial four hosts to uh, be sized according to. So one of the things that VLC is going to do for you is it's going to create four nested ESX hosts that it will join together into a cluster and uh, instantiate vSAN on that cluster. And I'm going, to show you the, I'm going to show you these in just a minute. But if you want to change from the default size, which I did, because again, my goal was to dedicate that one R620 pretty much to run in VCF. And my disk sizes are larger, my memory size is larger than what the default is. But this is where you would go about changing that. This would be one of the first things that I would recommend that you do, is at least go and look at it and make sure that um, it's the size that you want. Any, any questions up to this point? I probably should have stopped a minute ago, but I was kind of getting in a roll. Any questions up to this point? I think the only question is uh, the version of VCF and the 3.9, right? Yeah, 3.91, actually. 3.91, okay. Yeah. And let's just walk through how the nesting works on this 
Actually, hey, Dale. Just so everybody, yes. Is that on the previous screen there, is 64 gigs the minimum that you've seen at work, or have you done it with, like, say, 32 across all four? I'm um, pretty sure it'll work with 32. That's the default, if I remember correctly. Um, what the, the biggest thing that you can do is to make sure that you have enough total memory on the platform that you're going to use. In the Slack support channel, I forget who it was, but someone demonstrated or at least posted a screenshot of them running VLC on a host that had 128 gig, and they were out at about five hours of creation time. I'll show you in just a minute that my uh, VLC instantiations consistently run right at the three-hour mark. So I've got a couple of them that were at 257, I mean, within seconds of each other. So that's about how long it's going to take on a 256 gig platform with a little bit older processors, mine for E5 2690 uh, version ones, um, or sand, I think I think that's a Sandy Lake uh, generation. And yeah, with I'll, all I'll SSDs, add, yeah, go ahead, Dale. I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll add that uh, you can increase the size in that JSON, but don't decrease it below the minimums that we start for default because it won't work after that. And then, yeah, the smallest we have on record is a physical host with 128 gigs of RAM. Okay, thank you. There you go. All right, so let's walk through the nesting just a little bit, and I don't. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I really want to spend time actually in the environment. But I think it's important to understand that by the time we get up here, we're three layers deep. And there's even a caveat, I think, in the install guide that if you're going to show this to customers, make sure that you annotate that. In my particular case, it's pretty snappy, and I think you'll see that. That's not necessarily the case for everyone. Uh, again, a lot of it depends on what else you have running, how you uh, configure it, what kind of disk you have. Anyway, bottom line is you're going to be, by the time you get to the SDDC manager and the vCenter that is instantiated as part of the VLC or the VCF that VLC instantiates, you're at three layers deep in terms of nesting. At the physical layer, again, I'm running on a single physical host. I did go and set up uh, a separate uh, standard switch that I'll make reference to and a port group on that standard switch specifically for the um, nested ESX that you see at layer two, these guys right here. And then I made sure that at this layer I had uh, consistency in terms of setting up the distributed virtual switch, which gets instantiated as part of the VLC or the VCF bring up that VLC triggers. Here's that jump box that I was just on and referring to, and I'll show you that indeed we do have two NICs configured there. Any questions on the, any questions on the nesting? Does this kind of make sense to everybody? I know I'm going kind of fast, but again, I want to get to the environment to show you guys. All right. Questions? Anybody? So far, so good. All Actually, right, cool. I got one more for you. Have you noticed or yes. tried any difference between using a regular port group with just promiscuous mode or the new update in 6.7 uh, where you can do a different type that does not uh, have a Mac learning or whatever? They enabled that new feature inside of 6.7? Uh, no. And uh, yeah, we require all three. Yeah, we require all three of those to be configured to allow. Okay, That's so it probably would make a difference. Then. Okay, yep, just checking. Okay, so the next file that you want to be mindful of, and the rest of my demonstration is going to, there are two ways that you can. Here, it's probably easier for me just to do this. All 
All right, so I just kicked off the script, and it's a PowerShell script, and it's going to bring us to a pretty simple little GUI that we're not going to bother filling out, but I'm going to show you why it's important that you understand what's going on here. And I was talking with Ben and Heath when I first started this. Again, remember my fear and trepidation about just jumping into this with both feet. And I'm a pretty good network guy, so I was like, yeah, yeah, I got DNS, I got NTP, I got DHCP. I, you know what, I'm just going to do the I will build it. I think it was Ben, maybe it was Heath, said, you know, probably a good thing to do would be for your first instantiation for you to do the build it for me. Well, that was some of the best advice that I received, period. Because in clicking on the build it for me, there are some fields that you need to fill out that we'll talk about in just a minute. But it allows you to see the entire process happen once. And then once you successfully get through that process, then you can kind of go back and figure out, well, you know, I need to make some adjustments. Or in my case, I need to make huge adjustments because of the address overlap that I had between the management the VCF management subnet in my ISP network. So my advice to you would be to do the build it for me. Now let's go take a look at what that build it for me does kind of in the background. I'm going to go ahead and kill this off right now. All righty. There we go. All right. So let me see if I can get this, pop this down here. Here's that file that is going to be read when I click on the build it for me options. And this is actually the file I had to go in to change the IPs. And you can see that we I'm not going to go through each line here. But this is where we define things like the IP address, the host names. Uh, you also, this is where you want to put in your license keys for the different products that make this up. And as I go down through it, you'll see this is also where we define the distributed switch. It gets instantiated. Everything is in here. So you'll want to open this file up and become familiar with it. You'll want to understand the things that you might want to change and the things that you probably shouldn't change. Again, if we go back to my diagram or my uh, slide presentation that has a diagram, I had to change this address space right here. I didn't have to change this address space, this one, or anything over here. So in doing that, the where I had to go and do that was in this JSON. So once once I did that, let me show you what that created. Once I ran that JSON, then it's going to go and it's going to create the management domain. And as I click down through here, and we're at the SCDC manager, you can see that it creates this cluster of four hosts. In addition, there's some other things. Now, if you're kind of like me, you're not really all that familiar with working at an SDDC manager level. 
So let's go take a look and see what vCenter looks like. And now we're on that vCenter that's associated with that SDDC that got instantiated when I ran VLC. In fact, you can see this warning up here. This vCenter is managed by SDDC manager and caution you to make sure that you don't make any changes that might interfere with VCS ability to update the environment. That was another thing that I wanted to be able to understand and to be able to talk with the customers about was the ability for uh, lifecycle management to take place in the VCF environment because I see a lot of customers struggling with that. So here is the end product once I ran that JSON and you can see that it creates uh, four ESX hosts it also creates um, some edge devices on the NSX V side. It creates three log insight nodes, which in my case are turned off. It also uh, creates three NSX controllers, NSX manager, two platform services controller, an SDDC manager, and vCenter. All of that gets automatically instantiated when when I run the script and it's working off of this JSON called build it for me. So everything that you see on there is defined here at some point. And again, my advice to you is to get familiar with this JSON, understand everything in it and how you might go about adjusting it if the need to adjust it arises. All right, so, so one of the big questions that you may have and I had was understanding the step between the physical and the first level of nesting. In fact, and this isn't my first uh, nesting experience, but even I kind of got a little turned around at one point because I'm sitting here watching the script run and it doesn't look like it's doing anything. And I even shot a message to Ben and Heath. I'm going, guys, should I be seeing something happen? And they said, well, what level are you at? And it's important that you understand what level you're at. If I'm sitting and now where I'm going to take you is to my V center that runs the rest of the lab. And let me explain to you why we're going there. If I go back to my diagram real quick, there's a vCenter that's running this portion of the lab. Well, this ESX host is part of, it's a cluster of one that's still being managed by this vCenter over here. When we go take a look at this vCenter, we will see those four nested ESX hosts show up on that particular platform and here, the, here are those four nested hosts. So those are the four, what I call physical VMs that make up the management, the nested management domain. Notice that none of the other things that you see over here, none of these VMs are even visible over here because they don't exist over here. They exist here. So again, you kind of got to understand where to look in the nesting to make sure that you're following along with this. If we go and look over here, and one of the big things that I thought about for a long time was how do I configure the networking? 
and you'll see that what I ended up doing on this physical host was creating a separate standard switch. And here is that standard switch that I plug all of the virtual machines, these four um, ESX hosts that get instantiated. This is the Cloud Builder appliance. And then this is my jump box, that Windows 10 jump box I showed you. I plug them into this port group called BCF internal. And notice there's no VLAN ID associated with this. And then I have a physical NIC that goes into, hang on one second, we'll go back over here. I have a physical NIC that goes into my 5548 switch where um, I mark it with a particular VLAN ID to allow me to do everything that I need to do in terms of routing it around. So that's the first level of nesting and networking that I had to deal with. Any questions on up to this point? Is it all in the documentation as far as the physical networking requirements? I think it is, but I'd like to say it's not at the level that I'm taking you guys to today. Okay, because yeah. there is... <clears throat> We did just recently update the documentation, so it is different from what you've seen last day. Okay. And there's two update slides at the end because I didn't have time to go back and incorporate the update into what I was doing. So, and anyway, so now let me take you and show you what the second level of networking looks like. And where we're going to go here is we're going to go look at the uh, distributed switch that gets created again if I hop back over here here's that distributed switch that gets created as part of the instantiation and here are all those different port groups on the distributed switch uh, sorry uh, these all get created as part of the SDDC instantiation or the BCF instantiation that VLC is doing. They're governable, names, everything, right here in this part of the JSON. And so each of those port groups are leveraging a different VLAN, I'm assuming, right? So does that mean you have to trunk those down at the physical layer or only nope. the ones that you need to route in and out? No, and there's no, as you, as you walk through these, you'll find that there's no VLAN IDs associated with any of them. Oh, wow. Okay. And that, that was why I went and created the, this switch with no VLAN ID. And then I got to the point where it's like, okay, how am I going to get these guys on VLAN 100? I needed them on VLAN 100 so that I could do routing because I'm routing essentially from this physical environment over to the nested environment. You notice that when I went to log into SDDC manager, that it was pretty seamless. You know, I just typed and it just went. Well, there's a whole a series of routing, there's a whole routing architecture that I had to set in place to allow for this ease of access along with doing some stuff like DNS conditional forwarding and things like that. So that's the point I wanted to be at was so that I could access the VCF environment just as easily as what I access my physical um, lab environment. So again, you can see as you walk through this that there aren't any VLAN IDs associated with any of these. Okay. You Does that answer your you question there, Steve? Yeah, you, you can if you want to, but uh, you don't have to. 
Ed Trank, it will simple. It will astronomically increase the complexity of what you have to do. Yes. Okay. And again, um, remember remember that advice that I was given and I gave you guys. Do this once simply. Do it in the build it for me mode and just watch what happens. And when you get where you've done that successfully a couple of times, then you can start to change things. Yeah. All right. so I did. I tried to do a nested PKS environment one time and I never finished it. Um, but I was following a blog series that Keith Lee had done. Uh, and it's like an eight part blog series, but he walks through step by step how to do all that nesting with the, the different VLAN requirements and things like that, which I would imagine is fairly similar to what you would need to do here. So if anyone's interested. Yeah. I mean, it, it's going to get complicated pretty quick. You know, I mean, um, for me, it wasn't about, can I do the networking? It was, I wanted the ease of access to do exactly what I'm doing right now to be able to, for my existing environment, just hop right over into the VCF environment and have it be usable, have it be at a performance level where I can go and click on stuff and it actually works. And I, I've achieved that. Having said that, my, probably my next thought process is to take one of my physical hosts One of, uh, sorry, one of, one of these guys over here and uh, break this cluster up and to bring him over and make a two physical node uh, VCF cluster and to re-instantiate VCF and to use it really as the foundation for my home lab. That's something that's a little bit farther out. So I've spent a lot of time going probably more time than I wanted to, uh, going through a lot of this. Let me just stop right here and say, okay, what do you guys want to see? What can I show you that would make you feel more comfortable? Because I got about 10 minutes to do that, and I want to leave the last five minutes for he so that he can tell you about some things that are coming up. So, Dale, there's one question at the moment that was asked in the um, chat, and it's, is for Nick support possible um, in this nested environment? I missed the question, I'm sorry. Is um, for Nick support available in the nested environment? So for physical Nick's yeah. at the physical host level, I guess. Right, you've only got the one uplink. I guess that's the question. Yeah, and and uh, I could have created uh, more. This host is still managed by this V Center, so I have some other things on here. I have a distributed switch running. Yeah. I mean, I can move workloads out of my oh, lab so environment no, think, onto here. So I think I think the Sorry. question's around uh, when you add hosts into a workload domain for VCF. Um, you can have four NICs supported rather than two, we've got to use the API. Okay. So, I guess. Uh, so it's a, it's a question from, although it's my question, uh, with the VCF391, there was multiple NIC supported right now, actually. So the question is, can I, uh, uh, build it with the VLC, the Fornic support, so I can can deal around with uh, within uh, in the lab. Yes, you can. I'll put a link to a blog about that in the uh, chat here. So I just have to extend the the, the PowerShell script and uh, modify the JSON on the yeah. JSON as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's only available by API, like somebody else was saying earlier. So, but yes, it is doable. I'll send a, a good blog. Okay, thank you. So I did see the question about uh, embedded uh, PSC. So again, one of the things about uh, VCF is that VCF wants to deploy 
the same way every time it deploys. And the 391 is set up to deploy those two external PSCs. I'm going to turn it over to Heath here in a few minutes, and maybe that's almost more of a Heath question on whether they're going to move away from uh, the external PSCs and move to an embedded PSC. But again, this is the instantiation that I got when I ran uh, VCF 391 via VFC. And Trevor, you said, is there an option to select multiple L1 data stores or do you need one very large one? It's funny that you would bring that up because, and I mentioned this, I think, to both Heath and Ben, there's a little ambiguity in the user guide. When I read it, I thought I had to have 2T per host. So I went out and bought a 8T worth of SSDs and stuck them in this particular uh, physical platform. Well, come to find out, you didn't exactly need 8T. Uh, you need a 2T total. So here's that, um, here's that one single large data store that I created that the, these guys take from that data store to create the disks that are offered up to the vSAN cluster. Holy crap, did that make sense to anybody right there? Sorry, Steve. Yeah, yeah, no, I got you. I was asking, because when you're going through the uh, the script and you're picking up, bring you know, bring it up yourself or, or do it all for me, uh, if you say do it all for me, it says which data store you're going to deploy to. That one data store, if it's just a single host, right, is going to consume or that's where everything's going to be deployed to. So what's the main yes. cause of that data store disk need to be then? Is it two terabytes? We recommend two terabytes. Uh, 800 gigs is the minimum I think we're putting into the, um, this for the new version that we just published the other day. So okay. you know, get away with a minimum of 800, uh, but we recommend two terabytes of SSD to do more with it. Okay. Because we need so the only, oh, terabyte SSD now sorry. for 100 bucks or so. Yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah. So the only thing that's in that data store right now are those four uh, nested ESX hosts with this configuration right here. And if I look at the summary for the data store, you can see what it says has been used. Yeah. I always say 800 is the minimum. It'll get you going, but then you can't do much with it after that. So, so is it deploying those hosts uh, thick or thin? It's all thin. Okay, cool. And then I heard you say uh, the new version that was just published a few days ago. Does that mean there's a 4.0 version? Not yet. No, there's. We did a 3.9.1 version two, made okay. things a little bit simpler. Can you so speak because to I want to make 4.0? Uh, uh, yeah, hang, we'll hang on one second. Time. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to wrap this up in about two minutes. Uh, you're going to get either this presentation, the uh, uh, recording, or you'll get the slides. One of the biggest things that you need to do is acquaint yourself with the log locations, because if you have a failure, and uh, I don't know what the out-of-the-box success rate is, but I think it's probably pretty low, you're going to want to look at these logs that are annotated here. The next thing, and this is where I'm going to turn it over to Heath. Heath, you want to? I have two slides on the uh, V2 update. Do you want to just speak to these real quick, and then we can open it up for futures questions? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so we we published version two, like we were talking about. Um, we updated yep. the guide to make things easier, uh, hopefully easier to understand. If if you're confused on anything while you're going through this, reading the guide, please. Uh, put that feedback in the Slack so we can make it better and uh, remove confusion. Um, but otherwise, we're trying to make it as easy as possible with all these new updates. Uh, Ben's doing some pretty slick stuff, uh, making sure that 
we even do some interesting pre-validation of your environment before we kick everything off. So uh, you can try things and if it's not configured quite correctly, like you're missing uh, promiscuous mode on and Mac, you know, address, all those different settings, we, uh, we're pre-validating a lot of those things to make sure before we even try and launch the script. So uh, we're trying to make it as easy as possible to have basically a, a lab in a box where you, once you launch this, it just goes. And I'm, I'm here to confirm that once you get it figured out and you do have a workable solution, you can absolutely blow this away and three hours later have it completely reinstantiated. Right. Yeah. One of the one of the key things and let me let me just back up and explain one thing that I probably should have explained a little bit better. Is when you're doing the build it for me, the cloud builder appliance takes on some different roles. NSX, it's gonna do some BGP and the BGP it's going to do is between these two AS numbers here. I have a static route in my router that allows me to get to all of these networks via the cloud builder. If you don't use the build it for me, if you do, I will build it, then you're going to have to replace that functionality of DNS, NTP, DHCP. You're going to have to replace all of that functionality and provide the BGP connectivity from your router into these environments. By using this as a router into the nested environment, and that's probably kind of a bad term, but it's the best one I can come up with right now, radically simplifies what it takes to get this thing up and operation. All right, it's all you, Heath. I'm sure people got a lot of questions about the futures. If you guys have any questions about what I've done, I'm more than willing to share everything that I've done with you guys. It's really not that difficult. It just takes some planning and you kind of got to work through what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Heath? Yeah, no, you did a real good job coming um, <clears throat> as far as 4.0 goes. Uh, I'm not a, able to do, I'm not marked as a presenter, so I can't show you my screen, but I do have a, a live working lab of this um, in version 4.0 of Cloud Foundation. So I've got vSphere with Kubernetes up and running in. An hey, Keith. Yep. I just promoted you to a panelist. You should be able to share your screen. And there was just a little dropout during that promotion. Okay. You see my screen now? Yes. Yep. All right. So there we go. So there's a there's a live lab environment in a nested environment with uh, deployed by the VLC using Zoomer Cloud Foundation. So this is this is what it completely deploys. So what Dale was kind of showing you is it creates that first uh, management cluster, the first four nodes. And then in order to deploy it on Cloud Foundation, you have to deploy the vSphere the Kubernetes part into another workload domain. When you deploy another workload domain, it deploys a whole other vCenter and NSX controller manager cluster. And so that's this cluster that we've labeled as K8s. Um, and then from there, we were able to turn on the workload control plane or the vSphere with Kubernetes uh, portion of it. And you can see then we got Harbor turned on and Harbor created these uh, Harbor containers for uh, vSphere with Kubernetes. And so here's the supervisor control plane virtual machines. And so this is all running nested inside my environment. So I can move this control panel. And so looking at my lab environment, I'm running that all on these two physical hosts. So my main one being this HP, I have 384 gigs of RAM in it. It's only using about 256 to get kind of management stood up. And then that second cluster uh, for the Kubernetes portion, I'm running on this one. This is a 256 gig host. So in the end, it's to get this all up, vSphere with Kubernetes nested, two workload domains, everything is about a half a terabyte of RAM. It's a pretty big lab. Um, 
so that that kind of just shows you know we've got all the like he was showing all the nested hosts uh i'm doing currently the i will build it method using uh, a voyos router and configuring the router myself um yeah, which is completely possible. Uh, this DC01 is my jump host that I'm using to get into everything. Uh, but otherwise, once it up, uh, you can see, I'll go back to the dashboard here on Cloud Builder. I've got the management domain, the VI workload domain configured all in here. This is where we're doing an automated edge cluster deployment for NSX. Um, and then from the solutions page, we can do a fully automated Kubernetes uh, workload management deployment from here and get this all instantiated and configured with uh, these group Kubernetes. So all completely doable with the VLC. Ben is, uh, he's the main uh, developer on the, the VLC code itself, the script that makes all this. And we're actively testing and making this uh, work as much as possible. So he's, he's on PTO this week, otherwise he'd be on this call. Um, but uh, it is coming. So as soon as uh, VMware Cloud Foundation 4 goes generally available, we will make the uh, code for the VLC uh, on that day or shortly thereafter. But uh, as far as today on the current beta builds that we're working with, it's working. Awesome. Yeah, I think this is super helpful just because uh, Cloud Foundation is one of those things that it's been difficult for us to kind of play with and get our hands on it, right? But yeah, the cloud builder, yes. SDDC manager, this is going to be very beneficial, I think, for everybody. Yeah, and it, it, all this nesting does get a little confusing. The first time I saw it, it was uh, kind of interesting. But uh, once you get your head wrapped around it, like Dale's saying, uh, you know, use, we highly recommend, get a, get a small server that's going, use the build it for me. We try and make it as easy as possible. And then start poking around, figure out how this thing really works. And then once you wrap your head around it, then blow it all away and try a different way. And yeah. A great method for learning. And what about that Slack channel? Is that a public facing Slack channel? Can anyone do it? It is public facing, yep. So VLC okay. is open to the public. So you can feel free to share the VLC with uh, customers. There was a recent, it was like a week or two ago, there was a VMUG uh, live online thing. And I did a whole presentation on the VLC. So for all our customers, uh, it's been a public facing. Uh, product now that we let customers have the script and deploy a uh, nested lab environment. And we're even recommending if you've got customers uh, that are interested in doing like a POC, you want to play with this and they got lab equipment. Uh, so from a TAM perspective, feel free to you know figure this out and stand up a POC of cloud funding to help your customers get familiar with it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably worth the disclaimer that we always have to state that Nothing nested is supported by VMware. Right. So, and it's obviously work, working. It's very stable. Again, I can totally wipe out what I have today and reinstantiate it in three hours and know that it will come back the exact same way. I mean, that truly is infrastructure as code. Uh, but, um, you know, I... I can't, not that I could ever call support for my home lab, but you guys get the idea. Make sure yeah. you, if you're going to do this with your customer, make sure that they understand that. Yep. Um, just for lab, just for getting a good feeling of how Cloud Foundation works. And then as you're trying to figure this out on VLC, hit the Slack channel, myself, Ben, and uh, the rest of our tech marketing team. And then hopefully you guys can help support customers or anybody else once you get a good understanding how it works. I know Dale's been in there answering questions for people as it comes up. So you we're trying to do it uh, at a best effort community support with the VLC. As people get comfortable with it, you know, feel free to join in and help other people out. Absolutely. Uh, so I know we're out of time. A couple of quick questions from Sasha in the, in the chat here. Uh, did you first deploy through the vCenter or directly to the physical ESXi host? So in, in my in my particular case, that 620 that you saw me deployed on, I created a cluster of one. There is a process where you can break communication between the vCenter and that particular host. I didn't want to do that, so I created a cluster of one, and I never had any issues with deploying to that cluster of one. 
Right, and we, we do spell that out in the guide now, the different iterations of hitting uh, ESXi host by itself or ESXi host with a vCenter in a cluster one, like you're saying. So we've got a couple of iterations of how you can configure that. We do support both versions. So you guys did the deployment all through a vCenter because it didn't work out for me uh, because it takes ages and didn't finish. And when I choose the, to to remove the vCenter connection and deploy it straight to the host, it took me for a half hour and everything went fine. So. Yeah, I, I, I deployed mine through vCenter, like I said, just by selecting that cluster. Okay. And the vCenter is a 6.7 actual, actually. Yeah, uh, right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I did, yeah, I deploy mine through vCenter as well. We support both methods. So if there's something sticky that's not working, we can try and help you out on the, on the Slack channel. I'm uh, gonna, gonna try that then next time. Hey guys, for the 4.0 stuff, since you have more than four hosts there and you're deploying another workload domain too, does that mean that you have to have a, or would you recommend those two physical hosts to be managed by a vCenter or can you point it at actual two independent and hosts and say, deploy some here, deploy some here? Uh, you can move things around. So uh, as long as your topper X switch is uh, capable of passing packets. So you can see I've got ESX one, two, three, and four. That's my management domain. I have it spread across two different physical hosts. Um, and then even that additional workload domain, I've split it um, because they kind of have different resource usage. So I've been playing with balancing it. Um, so initially when you deploy, it, it deploys all four on one of them. And then I just V-motion them on the physical layer uh, before things get too crazy and there's <laughs> any VMs running on them. But there's some tricks there that you can mess with for kind of spreading load out if you can do it. Um, but the VLC does kind of say you can only deploy it to a host and a SSD, right? So uh, mm -hmm. I put them each in one standalone cluster and then bring them up and then vMotion them before any of the VMs get on them in the nested layer two. All right. So definitely vCenter, but still standalone. Okay. Yep. That makes okay. sense. <clears throat> awesome. Any other questions from anyone? I know we're a little over time here. All right. Well, thanks so much, Dale. Uh, Heath, thanks for being on the call. Uh, this is awesome. So I'm, I know what I'm going to be doing this weekend. So <laughs> <laughs> me too. thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Right. Bye yeah, bye. Guys, See you next level. Feel free to reach out to me if you need any help. Okay. That's good. Thanks everybody. Thank bye. you. Have a good weekend. Take care. Bye. You too.